uh, Jack Wu, uh, who's kind of, um, he's also involved in security. And Jack, we did, are you still there or um, did you step away? <laughs> Fantastic. Jack, can you uh, bring up your presentation and talk about, um, you know, your firm or what you guys do? And I, I just find it very interesting, yes. you know, what's been happening. And I'll, I'll give a quick rundown. I grew up in Miami uh, and uh, during the riots in Miami and, and uh, lived in Philadelphia during some very insecure times then. And obviously witnessing what happened in the last couple of weeks has given me a lot of thought about how people really need to up their security. We had Carol Pepper speaking uh, about how physical security is really the next domain for family offices. So I came upon uh, Nightly Security because it's a robotic, artificially intelligent uh, aerial security system. And it's really fascinating. And I was hoping that uh, I brought Jack on board because he's very uh, eloquent. And I'm hoping that he can talk about, uh, he's got a great presentation, looking forward to it. And that he can talk about, you know, what it is, where, what the future is uh, and where it's going. So Jack, take it away. Uh, thank you, Marty. Uh, setting some pretty high expectations there. <laughs> I hope I uh, will provide you guys with an entertaining presentation. So uh, our company is called Nightingale Security. Uh, we provide autonomous physical security for large corporate customers and uh, ultra high net worth uh, estates. Actually, uh, I'll, let me quickly talk about the product real quick. So what you see here is you see a drone. Uh, it's a data gathering platform. It could take off by itself, land by itself, charge by itself. Uh, uh, our customer calls it a Blackbird. And the base station that you're looking at, it's this nest. So the, the bird can land and take care of itself. Uh, the the uh, nest itself is actually an edge-based computing platform. Uh, what that means is all the data that we gather is actually right at the edge. And all the com uh, computation is also performed at the edge. And we do this for security purposes. Uh, we have customers that are both government and large corporations. So they prefer to have their data on site rather than up in the cloud. Um, so automation is a mega trend. So the economic downturn brought by the current pandemic is accelerating the adoption of automation technologies. Uh, some of the technologies that are uh, driving adoptions are uh, mobile robots, uh, expanded use of AIs and machine vision, uh, which are creating new opportunities in robotic applications. Uh, so like the you know, mainframes, terminals, PCs, smartphones, each successive computing platform uh, actually is produced at a much larger number. So uh, I predict that in the future, you're going to have way more robots or IOTs, uh, mobile IOTs, uh, than all the computing, all the previous computing platforms combined. So it's a tremendous uh, a, a market opportunity. Um, you know, since we're on the subject of, uh, you know, soci uh, economic downturn, uh, economic downturn typically, you know, bring about socioeconomic instability. And this is something that um, uh, we've seen around the world. So it, it's not unique just to America. So this is another trend. Uh, and unfortunately, this trend is more negative. Uh, uh, the wealth gap has created a lot of resentment uh, among a lot of people. So uh, recently what we're seeing is protests erupting in major cities, uh, but I believe that the underlying driver for this is actually socioeconomic. Um, so the uh, value of being able to provide security is going to become uh, more important uh, in the uh, uh, importance of uh, maintaining social order. Uh, so those things are going to generate uh, global demand for uh, security technologies. So here are some interesting numbers. <laughs> this is the stuff that I kind of just, you know, uh, dug up on Google. Uh, so, you know, popular movements, uh, uh, you know, socioeconomic instability uh, often results in political and social movements. So uh, let's take a look at some interesting numbers here. Uh, these numbers are actually uh, from an article by Erica Chenoweth. Uh, she's a political scientist at Harvard University. Uh, there's good news and there's bad news. So the good news is uh, most movements uh, 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 succeed because they're nonviolent. So you got about 
uh, you know, success rate there. Uh, uh, the violent ones are about 26%, but the bad news is it only takes about 3.5% of your population to be committed to a movement in order for this movement to gain enough momentum to get the rest of the population really kind of galvanized behind it and to succeed. And we've seen this throughout history. Uh, currently, uh, uh, the, uh, in, and this is probably bad news for the Chinese government, but uh, in, in Hong Kong, we're seeing, uh, you know, movements that are way north of the 3.5 percentage, uh, you know, participation rate. So, um, well, so one person's movement is another person's nightmare. Um, so in the last decade, uh, demand for surveillance technology has really increased dramatically with double digit compound growth year after year. Um, according to the Wall Street Journal, uh, it is uh, projected that by 2021, we're going to see uh, about uh, a 30% increase um, in uh, security cameras from 770 million around the world to over 1 billion. So this, this is clearly a trend. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying we're moving towards a dystopian world, but um, given the facts that's being presented, uh, socioeconomic uh, gaps, uh, you have uh, you know, governments around the world uh, uh, realizing that they want to monitor their citizens in order to keep order, and the advent of social media that enables the masses to organize very quickly and efficiently um, I believe that uh, surveillance technology is going to become uh, not just important, but a necessity. So, Jack, I just wanted to just jump in for one quick second here. So, you know, I see that obviously, even though people are being videotaped, for a lot of them, it doesn't really matter. So, so these videotapes are kind of like defensive, like it tells you what happens after the fact. So, so you know, I, I was wondering about, you know, what, your guys, what you guys do and, and where you are in that space of being able to alert people real time. Yeah, so, so our system is capable of autonomous threat detection. Um, so the system can, uh, you can set, let's say you want to patrol the parking lot uh, between midnight to uh, 7 a.m. There should be no cars or people uh, within the parking lot. Uh, the system can patrol that uh, uh, via its, its uh, a schedule. So you can program a patrol schedule and a patrol route, and it will automatically detect and alert you if it detects uh, a person or a vehicle within the parking lot during that time frame. So, yeah, the whole the whole so, idea of robotics it has, it has recognition yeah. technology, like software yes. that recognizes the difference. Okay. Yes. Yes. Our our algorithm is flexible enough that it could be trained to recognize different objects. Now, that's not unique to us. That's that's actually you know just the overall uh, direction where you know object recognition has developed and you know machine learning you know algorithm has developed uh, but we just been around for six years uh, we have a lot of time to make mistakes uh, you, you know progress comes with a price and we've been paying our tuition so uh, we understand uh, where the technology is going and we have a solid foundation in building uh, a very uh, extensible uh, a technology platform so later on, we can recognize forklifts, we can recognize delivery vehicles. Um, so uh, when, when we get to a world where all the robots are going to communicate with one another, and that's part of our patent is what we call R2D2D, relay to drone to drone. So uh, what that does is it enables uh, different robots, uh, not just our drones, but uh, ground robots to communicate with us. But the overall uh, vision is one day you're going to have all these robots talking to each other, collaborating with one another, um, and that's actually so. So, so uh, uh, to to uh, Manish's point, uh, cybersecurity is actually very important, uh, and we take it very seriously. So, um, so, so uh, what we do uh, is, well, you know, the Great Recession of uh, 2010 sparked the Occupy movement, uh, which was really inked in my memory. Um, and sort of made a lasting impression. So uh, I want to create a company that will combine the mega trend of automation with the market opportunity brought about by social instability. So our solution of robotic aerial security was born. 
Um, now, we're, we're, we're created to provide an autonomous security solution for large enterprise, uh, you know, mostly. Uh, the system includes software and hardware, which are inseparable when it comes to uh, providing a real robotic solution. Um, in the technology we have developed, uh, position as well uh, in disrupting the $100 billion uh, a global physical security market. Now, the U.S. alone spends $42 billion in men guarding every year with 1.1 million jobs being categorized as security guards, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So uh, this is big money. Uh, it is also ancient. Uh, we're using people to do jobs that are highly repetitive. Uh, you know, most security guards, the turnover is so high. You, it's, 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 it's rare that you see the same security guard there uh, for, you know, uh, years, you know, years after years. So, so there's a lot of... Uh, issues of applying human labor to do a task that humans aren't very good at. So uh, here are some of the uh, select customers we have. These are, this is like a, a typical pro, like, you know, example of what our customers look like. So for Lockheed Martin, we are dealing with uh, uh, securing a defense manufacturing facility. Uh, for Sanofi, it's a vaccine production facility, which is uh, quite interesting. Uh, it turned out that the United States uh, has only one major commercial scale uh, vaccine production facility. Uh, that's what I was told by Sanofi. Um, and the CDC actually have a virus vault on site that's manned by the FBI 24-7. So when I went there, I actually had to do the 10 fingerprint stuff. Uh, you know, the FBI has me on the file and so on. So that's, that's another critical infrastructure uh, we deal with. And then we also have the Social Security Administration. That's a government account, so we'll be patrolling uh, uh, the Social Security Administration's headquarters. Uh, now, all these deals uh, uh, sort of is a reflection that even though they are in different industries, but every single industry needs physical security. Uh, even rail logistics like Ferromex. So there's thousands of train jackings in Mexico every year. So Ferromex have uh, placed some of our drones uh, next to their, their uh, high-risk locations. So this way, before the train gets there, we're actually able to see if someone is blocking the, uh, uh, the, uh, the tracks, and then they can send in the federal uh, agents to go and clear the tracks so the train doesn't stop. Because the train, knowing that the tracks will be blocked, they have to operate very slowly, which increases the inefficiency of their entire railroad system. So this doesn't just, uh, this, this is not just a security issue. This is also an economic one as well. Uh, we also have Tavistock. These are very high, uh, well, uh, Tavistock is a company that does, well, they have a lot of different businesses, but the project that we're involved with is at Lona Lake Estates. It's a gated community with, you know, uh, very expensive homes. Um, I live in San Francisco, but even by San Francisco standards, those are very expensive homes. Um, and so these are very, uh, all, uh, very rich people. So uh, they're using us to uh, patrol the area to keep them safe. Jack, is that, is that the area yeah. where a lot of professional athletes live? Like in a uh, <laughs> you're absolutely right. And there's a famous golfer there. Yep. And some uh, famous pro basketball players. Yes. And tennis athletes, yes. Yes, yes. So, so privacy is an issue. Um, but they've, uh, you know, like, you know, without going into detail, uh, they've had incidents where, uh, uh, where, where uh, you know, not just safety, but, uh, uh, you know, human, human health and, and, you know, was, was, was threatened. So uh, this, is, this is prompting them. Now, uh, Mr. Minutes. Joe... Okay, uh, so you know, Mr. Joe Lewis, who owns the company, actually requested a direct audience with me, which I was really surprised. And he has a whole vision of uh, integrating our drones with their autonomous delivery vehicles on site. And that got me super excited because that's my vision as well. Anyway, so those are the uh, you know, typical customers. Now, the reason why we chose physical security is because physical security have some uh, you know, problems that robotics are perfect in addressing. Uh, things that we can do with cheaper, better, and faster. Uh, patrols are repetitive and monitoring is tedious uh, and well-trained guards are hard to find and they are expensive compared to robots. Uh, and during an alarm event, every second counts. 
So uh, lack of situational awareness can lead to human injuries and other liabilities. So when you don't get there quickly, sometimes by the time you get there, it's too late already. Um, and monitoring large areas are difficult and costly, uh, both due to the size and distance, as well as the uh, type of terrain that makes it difficult for humans and vehicles to traverse. Now, when you're flying, uh, you are terrain insensitive, so it doesn't matter what the terrain is. We can get there, uh, you know, in a beeline. So automation is the perfect solution for repetitive tasks, like I mentioned before. Uh, scheduled patrol from the air also offers more visibility and detailed record for a future investigation. Uh, you know, humans have, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a range of quality when it comes to memory. Uh, but our robots records everything it sees. Now we treat our robots like an employee. <laughs> so we have uh, human employees, uh, robot employees, and also AIs. So we have three categories of employees that are coming. Uh, now flying is the fastest way to get eyes on the event for a large area. So integration with existing sensors and alarms raises the value of it, the entire security stack, uh, including the legacy infrastructure. So, your, so our customer's existing uh, uh, alarm becomes way more effective and valuable when they are integrated with a system like ours. Uh, and that's in a, uh, a rapid response model. Um, for, you know, I think I mentioned this earlier, uh, you know, covering large areas is just a lot easier when you can fly. Uh, also, when you have emergency situations uh, that are unplanned, uh, a drone can provide situational awareness. So you can make sure your first res responders know what they're dealing with before they get there. So, so Jack, one thing I yeah. wanted to uh, give perspective on is that, I mean, in, in the prior slide, you're showing a drone looking at a site, but the reality is you can use multiple drones. Is that correct? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so uh, we, we, we believe that uh, robots to robot uh, uh, cooperation is, is the key to robotics in the future. Uh, humans, when we work together, we can accomplish greater tasks than by ourselves. Same thing with robots. They are just another intelligent species that we are uh, uh, creating, and they will evolve just like humans have evolved. They're in, they're in the baby phases right now, but we're going to teach the baby how to walk, and they'll run, and then they'll be able to do other things. So I just want to very quickly uh, show you guys uh, what what – what an actual autonomous uh, detection situation looks like. So you can see that the drone is now looking at a parking lot uh, in a road, uh, but as soon as the drone makes a turn, now, now you see there, there are vehicles there, but the drone is not sending out any alerts because that is not an alert zone. So the yellow area is what we call robotic autonomous intrusion detection here. That is a RAID zone, R-A-I-D. So when it's in a RAID zone, you see it automatically gave an alert saying car detected. So this is what we can do. The system can actually do this all by itself. Now, this is what it will look like in actual practice. Oops, sorry. Um, This is what it looks like in actual practice when, when we combine this with uh, a, 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 a perimeter sensor. So here you have someone trying to climb the fence. So we're able to integrate with the uh, perimeter sensors, whether it's optical, like a camera or a kinetic that, has, uh, that detects vibrations or a combination. Once the alert is, has been detected, uh, the human guards are alerted and the drone is automatically launched. So at this point, the drone is going to pursue uh, by going to the incident location. This is what we call ATR, autonomous response. Uh, I'm sorry, autonomous threat response. Uh, once it detects a person, it is able to track that individual. Now, the human responder at this point, and this is why we just got our first uh, you know, law enforcement uh, you know, customer recently. Uh, once it detects a person, it's able to track that target. And then the... Uh, uh, the reaction force, the folks that are responding to this, they will know exactly where the, uh, the threat is, the direction the threat is going, as well as the number 
of people that they're dealing with. So no more surprises. It, it really gives the defender a tactical advantage. So, so Jack, so, so the a drone detects somebody and it stays on them. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So now you can see it's performing uh, uh, autonomous landing or uh, autonomous precision landing. That's actually what we call a bottleneck technology in robotics. If you can't do that, you don't have a, you don't have a solution. That took us about 18 months to get right and another two years to perfect with all the edge cases. Uh, you know, what, what can go wrong will go wrong. So um, anyway. Hey, oh, so a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, so this, is, it, it recharges, right? I mean, it, it flies yes. around, it recharges. Yes. So, so yeah. most, most purchasers would, would buy more than one. They'd have a That's few correct. drones so they can have 24 seven coverage. That's correct. We're, we're, we're talking to Nestle right now, uh, both Nestle Mexico and Nestle Waters down in Los Angeles. Uh, and they want three units at Nestle uh, Waters in Los Angeles. And there are a total of eight locations. Uh, and each location in, Me in Nestle Mexico, they're talking about two to three units. Now, uh, this, is a, uh, uh, this is a case study by our existing customer, Lockheed Martin. So they have 20 plus potential sites. Uh, they have more than 20 facilities, but these are the 20 uh, plus facilities that they think that can use uh, technology like ours. Uh, they're expecting six systems per site. Uh, we're currently deployed at their first location. Um, the total number of systems is, is going to be about 120. Now, our annual subscription uh, is about $54,000 a year. So that equates to about $6.5 million uh, in revenue. Uh, in potential revenue uh, from from Lockheed Martin. So, uh, uh, so my, yeah. my other question, uh, somebody else is asking, uh, so there's, it seems like there's other companies in this space, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, are there costs similar to yours or, you know, who's your number one competitor? Our number one competitor is a company called Percepto uh, out of Israel. And, and, and I personally have a lot of respect for uh, Israeli technology. Um, you know, I think their, you know, technology, a lot of it is derived from the IDF. Uh, and I have friends, uh, uh, old friends that have, uh, uh, you know, they're Americans, but, uh, you know, they ended up, you know, going to Israel and, you know, serving the IDF and stuff. And, you know, we talk all the time. Uh, so they have a lot of good technologies. Uh, but I think what, what differentiates uh, between us and them is we take the approach of a commercially viable technology um, they would like to make the technology as, as great as it can be. But when it comes to uh, uh, that philosophy, the downside is the price point, which your product will have to be sold at, is, is a little too high for the current market to bear. Even, even early adopters who are willing and have a, a, you know, an urgent need for technology like this they have a limit to how much they can spend. So from the very beginning, uh, we have what we call the A-10 model. The A-10 is the Warthog, is the uh, aircraft that's been in service for you know, almost 50 years. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's still the world's best uh, 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 ground attack aircraft uh, for close air support. Uh, and the reason is not because it's expensive. The reason is it's simple and reliable. So our approach is to make our technology as simple as we can possibly can, because this is already a, a very challenging task for us to make something you know, reliable and then make it dependable. So it's actually commercially viable because the customers just want to you know, uh, use it like a car. Like you know, they want to put the key in, turn it on, expect the engine to, you know, to go on and you know, be able to drive uh, you know, to the next location. So a lot of robotics companies fail because they're trying to create this very sophisticated technology, but in reality, the customer doesn't care. The customer just wants something that works. So that's what really differentiates us. Um, so this, Doctor, this, so we have about a minute or two left, Jack. Yeah. Any, any closing thoughts? What, you know, what's your exit strategy? Are you going to go public? You know, where, where uh, is that? You know, to be honest, I think we'll probably get taken out in the next couple of years by uh, uh, either a defense or, or a large, you know, physical security outfit or someone uh, that is in the robotics field um, because we're, we're quickly building up a roster of marquee customers. 
Um, and, you know, each one of these customers, uh, you know, actually have a very, 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 very deep revenue potential. And the addressable market in critical infrastructures is about 15 billion here in the U.S. alone. And the I mean, kind of... The prior slides, is there's a million security guards in the U.S.? 1.1, actually. Uh, that's, okay. that's, yeah, yeah. That's okay. actually, Next you know, okay. a little old. Yeah, so, uh, and there are over half a million critical infrastructures here in the United States. So uh, that's the market that we're going after. And we're laser focused. Uh, most startups die of suicide, not homicide. So they're not, you know, you know, you don't die because of competition. You die because you make mistakes. And most of the mistakes that startups make uh, are because of the market opportunities are so, you know, could be so big, uh, um, they get distracted. So we don't care about anything else. We don't care about precision farming. We don't care about, uh, uh, you know, doing like, you know, bridge inspections and stuff. Can we? Yes. That will come later. But first we have to establish a foothold, a solid revenue stream where we can use that revenue stream to reinvest in our R&D and become a dominant force in terms of technology. Once we can do that, we'll automatically be able to cross over to other market segments. Jack, I think you're right. And I'm, I'm actually going to use that quote in the future with all these startups who call me nonstop. Um, yeah, stop committing any, suicide. Any closing you know, comments? Don't kill yourself. Absolutely. Any closing comments? No, I, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, in summary, um, you know, we have patented, uh, uh, you know, technology that's industry leading. Um, and our, you know, revenue back in 2018, when we first, uh, you know, went to market uh, with a finished product, uh, we generated 320,000 and we did 1.2 million in 2019. Uh, and in 2020, we're expecting over 2 million. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our, our, our sales pipeline got interrupted by COVID and our sales cycles anywhere between three to six months. So uh, a lot of the deals got is is now looking at being pushed out to uh, uh, 2021. Uh, otherwise, it would be greater than two million. Uh, like the Amazon deal, for instance. Uh, you know, we already got an approval for AWS, so AWS will be one of our biggest customers, uh, and that deal will uh, will be closed by November this year. We've already got the uh, entire project approved. Well, so. Jack, I think I think this market is actually going to be growing very fast. And like a lot of other things, I think it's going to be one of those things that's going to be pushed forward uh, five years, like telemedicine and other things on those lines. So this looks great. Thanks so much for presenting. I got to move on to the next speaker. Okay. Um,